First, let me introduce myself. My name is Deepak Fatak. I've been teaching here for 37 years. Like I was a student here, subsequently did my PhD, and I with the computer science department for uh, what, like 37 years. Uh, I have not taught computer programming course, this course, for more than 25 years. So, in some sense, I'm also learning with you, because what I, I this used to be my favorite course. I have taught it at least. 15 times then. But those days, the programming paradigms were different. The machines were different. We had a mainframe machine first. Then when I set up the Unix lab in the institute, we had some interactive machines. But today's computing environment is completely different. Of course, I have kept abreast with that environment through some other work that I do. But I'm teaching after a long gap. And I hope that long gap will not show in inadequacies in my teaching. Today is the first lecture. So in this lecture, I propose to discuss engineering and engineering education in general. Then I will describe research and critical thinking. What does it take? What does it mean? I will relate it, of course, to this course on computer programming and utilization. We'll then have a brief introduction to the course. And at the end, we'll have some quizzes. We are going to have quizzes in every lecture. Of course, today's quizzes, uh, as you shall see, are, uh, we will not carry any marks. But subsequent quizzes will carry marks. Marks, after all, is a driving force in most of your life, right? Marks, performance in exams, and so on. We'll talk about it later. I have used the term engineering in a generic sense. I include applied science as a part of engineering. So those of you who are studying science, even maths. Maths is the foundation of all scientific thinking. And science is the foundation of everything applied that we do. In fact, in the old days, there's nothing like civil engineering, electrical engineering, mechanical engineering. There used to be philosophers. They would work in mathematics. They would work in chemistry, physics, astronomy, applied research, whatever, whatever. Then subsequently, as the body of knowledge grew, humanity divided them and classified them as chemists and physicists and mathematicians. Initially, there were engineers, or engineers, as they were called. You know, engineering word comes from what root? It comes from ingenuity, means something novel, something different. So engineering is not very mundane, as we might think. It, at the base, it has some very exciting creative thinking associated with it. Anyway, the first set of engineers were never further classified. They were just called engineers, essentially mechanical engineers, because industrial revolution in the world occurred through the early engineering efforts of mechanical engineers. Subsequently, of course, specializations developed. So we had electrical engineering, civil engineering, chemical engineering, computer engineering, whatever, whatever, whatever. And I believe most of you are familiar with these branches because you belong to one of them, right? Unfortunately, when we divide the growing body of knowledge into nomenclatures like this, there is a tendency to think that my focus ought to be only on this. I would like to suggest to all of you that there are some very fundamental common engineering principles which must be known to all, no matter which field or discipline you are studying. Similarly, there are some very common principles in science and maths which must be known to all, even if you're not going to uh, become a physicist or a chemist. Because some fundamental concepts are critically important, as we shall see them uh, when we look at the research and critical thinking. So generally, the engineering is associated with human activities. But if you look at nature, you see the kind of engineering that is displayed for example, evolution of life forms is almost synonymous with evolution of engineering, although nobody called it engineering then. So look at how life forms evolved from amoeba, simple cells, to mammals, to monkeys, and ultimately to us. So what do you see there? Architecture and structure. Take human body. Energy storage and conversion. So I can, I can take chemical energy essentially, convert it into heat, convert it into muscular motion, mechanical movement, locomotion and mechanical activities. I can hold things. Later on, you will learn 
about degrees of freedom. If you have a mechanical gadget, in how many planes can it move? And the best degrees of freedom has been endowed by God into a human body. You look at how many ways your hands can move, the fingers can move, in how many different ways you can catch, reach, and so on. It's amazing. Signaling and messaging. If by mistake your hand touches fire, without any conscious thinking, your hand is withdrawn. How long it takes for your hand to be withdrawn? A split second. But do you know what all happens during that split second? The heat disturbs the nerves on the fingertips. The nerves carry a message through an extremely long chain of your nervous system. Extremely long chain. There are synaptic junctions across which messages pass through creation of chemical substances. And every time a voltage is created, a message is passed, that chemical substance is then destroyed by another substance which is also created simultaneously when the message is passed. It's amazing. And it happens at multiple junctions till the message is just your brain. The brain automatically initiates signaling to the muscular system. Because messaging system cannot control the movement. It's the muscular system which controls the movement which requires commands from the brain. And that command, again, through a similar mechanism, reaches back to the hand muscles, and the hand is withdrawn. All of this happens subconsciously. We are not trained for it. The natural evolution has trained us, the brain, for automatically doing these functions. So there is a lot of information processing that happens. And of course, with life forms, we associate growth and self-preservation, which is something which we have not been able to translate into the artificial entities like machines. I mean, if you keep multiple computers together and they live for 10 years, you do not get computer bachas out of them. You have to build every computer differently. So it's a very, very different ball game altogether. Mutation. Mutation means innovation and replication. These are all absolutely great principles of engineering, some of which the humanity has been able to crack and translate. Why I mention these is that very often when you study textbook science or textbook engineering, you think that is where the entire knowledge is and stop looking around you. But if you look at life forms, you will study a lot more science and engineering than restricting yourself to only books. So as I said, nature has the best engineering. It's also a very efficient engineering. Uh, everybody is familiar with nitrogen. All of you would have studied nitrogen. So, ammonia, for example. What's the formula for ammonia? NH, whatever. It has nitrogen, hydrogen, whatever. Do you know how ammonia is produced? Or do you know how nitrogen compounds are produced? Or from nitrogen compounds, how nitrogen is extracted? There is a chemical reaction. It requires huge energy input, high temperature, high pressure. Lots and lots of money is spent in, in creating, you know, big industry to build anything which fixes nitrogen. And yet, all the plants that you see around you, every green plant that you see around you, fixes nitrogen, because it requires nitrogen. It extracts nitrogen from the soil, from whatever compounds it gets. And that reaction happens at the normal temperature and pressure. We have not yet been able to crack how that happens. Look at the example of the firefly. You know firefly? Jugno, we call it in Hindi. Okay. It, in the night, if there are hundreds of jugnus flying, you can see some beautiful light emanating from them. Ordinarily, you associate light with heat. Ordinary bulbs. If a bulb is lit for half an hour, you can't touch it with your hands. You'll burn. Firefly doesn't burn. It is able to convert energy into optical energy or light without creating heat. It's something which we are just about starting to manage to do through what we call solid state light devices. The old LEDs are light emitting diodes in a form which consume very less energy because they don't waste any energy in heat, they can produce light. This, we're just figuring it out. And Jugnus have been there for a million years or whatever. So that is what is nature. Human body, I already explained, is the best form of engineering. It is now we look at the engineering education and teaching and learning in the context of engineering. So here's a question. Who teaches birds to build a nest? Have you seen birds building a nest? Every uh, uh, 
winter, the two small birds which come into the veranda of my house, I live in the hillside, and there are creepers uh, hanging around, so these birds will start building a nest. And it's amazing to watch them. It'll take about a month, they will pick out all kinds of nonsensical things that you see, twigs, leaves, uh, kachra, whatever, whatever. And at the end of one month, there will be a nice, long, uh, uh, sort of shanku-shaped uh, nest that will come up. And that nest is sturdy, architecturally sound. It is secure because when the eggs are laid inside, a snake cannot enter that nest. It hangs and it looks beautiful. This is engineering. So here's the question. Who taught birds how to build nests? Nobody. Probably they acquired a little bit of knowledge by looking at other birds, but very doubtful. This knowledge then apparently passed to, through, to them genetically. So genetic transfer of certain amount of knowledge is inherent in every living species. We also acquire that knowledge automatically. It is dormant in us. It manifests itself as we grow up. Look at your ability to see and recognize. We as humans get that ability within first few days of our birth. Nobody teaches us how to see. Nobody teaches us how to recognize mother, father, uncle, friends angry elder brother, everything we can recognize by, by seeing and feeling. The ability of sound, the basic sound ability is inherent, but the human language is different. That's the speciality of the human species and that needs to be learned. How do you learn that? By aping others, by listening to those sounds, by trying to reproduce those sounds. But the human knowledge grows so fast that we cannot depend only on genetics to automatically transfer that knowledge. Because genetic evolution takes millions of years. Whereas our time span is we want to do great things in our own lifetime, which is maybe 75 years, 100 years. So we don't have 1 million years to live. We don't have patience. And the body of knowledge is growing perpetually. So we need to tackle this large growing body of knowledge. And therefore, humanity is the only species which has created spatial entities within itself to handle this growing body of knowledge. That entity, that institution is called a teacher, who is a custodian of knowledge and who is supposed to spread knowledge. Knowledge is never transferred. It is, it is a nonsensical statement to say that a teacher gives and student takes knowledge. You all know basic material science, right? If any matter is transferred from one source to the target, the matter, amount of matter must diminish at the source and must increase at the target. So if I have been giving knowledge for 37 years, I should have nothing left with me by now. It doesn't happen. Why? Because I don't give knowledge. Knowledge cannot be given. Knowledge has to be generated in every thinking mind. So a teacher is merely an aid, a helper, a mentor to help you think so that you acquire that knowledge. Knowledge is always acquired. It's never given. But acquiring of knowledge can be facilitated. And we should all look upon a teacher as an institution who facilitates that acquisition of knowledge. I think this is very important because in any classroom, you will notice that if you are not very active, your mind is not concentrating on what is being discussed, and then you go back, you will find you have learned less during that period. There is no reduction in the intensity of lecturing that was happening. The reduction was in your mind, because your mind was not thinking at those moments. So please keep your mind alert, not only in classroom, but everywhere else, because it is the alert mind, a thinking mind, which acquires knowledge. And knowledge, again, has not to be obtained only through classrooms. That's another hogwash. It's nonsense. Classroom is one mechanism, a mechanism which sets a social context for education. Learning happens everywhere. Every human interaction should teach you something more. You know something from someone which you did not know earlier. It may happen once in a while, but your mind has to be alert always. I have perpetually benefited from human interactions. From every human, small, young, old, I have learned something. Keep that in mind. Why critical thinking is important? Are all of you familiar with Wikipedia? 
How many of you are familiar with Wikipedia? Can you raise your hands? Don't worry. Wikipedia is like an encyclopedia. Printed dictionaries and encyclopedias you get often. Wikipedia is the first encyclopedia which is completely in electronic format. What is more important, the knowledge content there is available under an open Creative Commons copyright to everybody. So that knowledge is not copyrighted. That knowledge is accessible and freely usable. So you just search for Wikipedia, you'll get it, and it's, it's an absolute, absolute fantastic bandar of knowledge. You can acquire as much as you can, you can see as much. In fact, there is an overdose. These slides prepared by my colleague, Professor Damdere, are representing some sort of gist of what Wikipedia says about critical thinking. It is, of course, purposeful and reflective judgment about what to believe or what to do in response to observations, experience, verbal or written expressions, and arguments. Please note that these are the fundamental mechanisms of learning. You observe, you learn. Not by observation alone, but that's the first step. You experience, you learn. You express, and you learn, and others learn what you think about what you're talking about. You argue, you discuss, and your thinking and your understanding is refined. You might be believing in some wrong notion. It gets corrected through arguments. You might be believing in right notion and somebody else may be believing in wrong notions. That somebody else's thinking gets corrected. Both of you may be believing in the right notion, but when you discuss, both of you might further refine that understanding and discover something which you have not understood. That's why it's so very important to have verbal and written expressions and to have arguments. Actually, I don't like the Wikipedia word arguments. I, I like the word discussion. You know, what is the subtle difference between discussion and arguments? Arguments tend to prove who is right or wrong. Discussions tend to prove what is right or wrong. And it should be very clear that we are fundamentally interested in what is right or wrong, or what is better representation of truth that we know, not who is right or wrong. That is trivial. From a knowledge point of view, that is trivial. But from a human point of view, it is very important. How much time we spend in our lives proving to someone, to our father, to our mother, to our teacher, that I was not responsible for that mistake, but he was or she was or something like that. That's a human trait. Because our ego does not permit us to take any blame, and therefore we defend ourselves, and in the process, convert even simple discussions into arguments. Very, very important to distinguish the two. I believe that the word argument is used in the constructive sense of discussions. Why is this ability important? This ability is important for various reasons. First of all, vast amount of information available. Take web, for example, the Wikipedia. Huge amount of information is available. How will you dissect what is important, what is useful, what is correct, what is not correct? So one must analyze the information available from not only one source, but from multiple sources, validate that information against each source, rejecting unreliable or illogical information, and then correlate information from various sources to make a cohesive whole. All of this is part of critical thinking. I mentioned research in my top sheet, so let me share with you what research is. You have heard of a MSc, B.Tech degree, right? All of you are participating in one of these programs. You know of M.Tech degree or M.Phil. You also know of a Ph.D. degree? Okay. In my humble opinion, Ph.D. is not just a degree. Ph.D. represents a mindset. So what is that mindset? That mindset is about the ability to look at generically into a problem, the wider perspective of that problem. That problem is in some context. What is that larger context? That is the first ability. The next ability is to understand that problem and the field of knowledge that is required to solve that problem. The third is very critical examination of every alternative solution that people have already tried. It has a nice name. It is called literature survey. But it's not just reading some literature and reproducing it in your thesis. It is critically examining that literature and understanding what all people have done to solve that problem. Then formulating a hypothesis. I think 
that I can solve this problem slightly differently, maybe using alternative 1, alternative 2, alternative 3. That PhD mindset also represents enormous rigor in both critical examination as well as analysis of your own suggestions. Nothing is done by Andaj Dappe, you know, I think this will happen, that's not, that's not critical enough. Why it should happen? Very rigorous examination. That mindset also represents extraordinary hard work because you have to examine each and every alternative. You examine 10 alternatives, 9 may fail, only 1 may yield result. But you don't know which one, so you have to try all 10. That mindset represents ability to articulate well because unless you articulate your ideas, others cannot understand those and discuss with you either to correct your arguments or to be convinced by your argument. So the ability to articulate well both in spoken language and in written language. And as you go to a PhD level, you have to be able to articulate well in written form because that's the only way. You, you will never come across your peers face to face always. Somebody sitting in Canada, somebody in Australia, somebody in Calcutta, somebody in Kachro, somebody in Jansugula, how, how do you find them out? So you have to write. Today you use emails, earlier people used to use postal mails and whatever. But essentially, ability to articulate succinctly and coherently. It's part of that mindset. And finally, the ability not to give up in spite of consistent failures. Keep doing things till you get success. When you acquire that mindset, your guide usually says, okay, write a thesis, submit it and get a PhD. Now, you distinguish between the degree, the thesis and the mindset. Don't you think this mindset is critically important? Actually, if you look around you, outside in the real world, you will find chief executives, works managers, political leaders, social leaders, leaders from many fields you will find that they don't have a PhD degree, but they have acquired this mindset. That is why sometimes you say, honorary doctorate is given. It's in honor of not that person's achievements merely, but that mindset that that person reflects. Sadly, you also find in this world, several formal holders of a PhD degree who have not acquired that mindset. Now, if that mindset is so critical at the level of research, don't you think it is critical at all levels of education? When you are studying the fifth standard in school, for example, <clears throat> do you not expect yourself to be able to articulate well in the language that you have been studying for five years? Does it not mean that in the fifth standard you should have acquired that part of the mindset of PhD which permits you to articulate well? When you are studying in 10th standard, do you not expect yourself to acquire the mindset of critical, analytical, scientific thinking, applying your knowledge of mathematical principles to whatever you are doing. When you are doing graduation, which are problem you are solving here, don't you think large part of that mindset in different form must be available with you? Therefore, it is my humble suggestion that every learner right from standard one is actually a PhD researcher. So what is PhD then? PhD is nothing but the ultimate culmination of the educational process. Throughout that process, you are trying to acquire that mindset. You acquire a little bit here, a little bit there, etc., etc. By the time you acquire a PhD, it's a, it's a social certification thing. Yes, you have reached a plateau which we can just see and appreciate, but we can't understand. We have yet to reach there. But, Nevertheless, it must be acquired constantly, bit by bit, right from first standard. I'm sure all of you have acquired part of that mindset. That's one of the reasons why you are here. You may not have consciously noticed it or understood it. My humble suggestion again is, please be conscious about acquiring that mindset, because that is what will make you great problem solvers. So this is the last slide on critical thinking. Critical thinking raises vital questions and problems, permits you to formulate them clearly and precisely. It gathers and assesses relevant information. It comes to well-reasoned conclusions and solutions. And it thinks open-mindedly about alternatives. I say so, therefore it is so, is not permitted in critical thinking. I may be wrong, has to be an underlying assumption every time I 
I get into the critical thing. And of course, it communicates effectively with others in figuring out solutions to complex problems. Uh, sorry for that goof up. I did not know that I'll be using uh, this environment. Next time I will check my slides properly. This is a slide which is a favorite of mine, which attempts to portray your journey to an exciting professional career. You are at a stage where you have just finished your school education, you are getting into professional education. You are trying to climb up the peak of that hill. That is the, that is the ultimate pinnacle. But the path is winding and it goes through several stages. The bottommost path you can see as it, it says exams. All of you are familiar with that? All of you have been giving exams for many years in the school, entrance exam, this, that, that. But you suddenly realize when you pass all the exams, you get a degree and you go out in the real world and you think you have studied this syllabus, that syllabus, that syllabus, and the first problem that comes your way you suddenly realize that the marks that you acquired in the class are not directly useful. But the knowledge that you acquire is useful. So then you trudge the path of knowledge for quite some time, acquiring more as you go by. Learning never stops, even after you pass out, because you will face umpteen situations which are completely different than you. When you do that, you get some success. Success is measured in, in two different ways. Material success, how wealthy I am. You know, for example, when I became a young teacher, I used to bicycle around with my wife sitting double seat with me and a young son in a basket. Today I move in cars, so I become richer. That's success. Professional success. You are a young engineer or a scientist when you join, then you become a research lab chief or a works manager. You become a chief executive officer. That is professional success. Professional success is also measured in terms of contributions that you make to that profession. New inventions that you do, whether it is in the a uh, shop floor in a factory or in a research lab. But these are the two majors, material wealth and professional advancement. However, you suddenly notice that even if you have achieved both of them, you find that you may not have left any significant impact on people and society around you. And you suddenly realize that to be recognized as the top person in whatever professional career you are, you also need to make an impact. That requires compassion, that requires sensitivity, that requires a greater understanding of your environment and sensitivity to try and do something about them. So look at all the humanity that you know of. Which are the people which come to your mind immediately? Mahatma Gandhi, Gautam Buddha, Jesus Christ, Muhammad Paigambar, Radha Krishnan. Why, who, are, who are these people? Were they gold medalists? No, not all of them. They did not succeed in the exam to get the president of India gold medal. Were they knowledgeable on every aspect of life? No, they could not solve a fourth order differential equation perhaps. It didn't matter. Were they most successful? Somewhere, somewhere not. If you heard of Babu Rajendra Prasad when he came in contact with Mahatma Gandhi during the Champaran Satyagraha, he was an extremely well-to-do lawyer. After staying with Mahatma for three days, he gave up his entire practice and committed himself to the national movement. When he retired as a president and died, he had zero wealth with him. Take Gautam Buddha, he was a prince. He gave up everything. So from a materialistic point of view, you would call such people stupid fellows. They gave up everything. But look at the impact that they have made. At the end of the day, and you don't have to wait till you become 70 years old to make an impact. You can start making impact even now. In fact, many of you would have been making such impact on people around you just by helping a friend, helping somebody, listening to someone in distress, trying to give advice. They are all issues of making impact. But here I am talking about professional impact, which means you do something substantial, something new, something different in any problem that you take up, such that you produce to the world, you give back to the world something which without you, the world would have been short of that mall. So what comes in the way? Why are you not able to reach all the way to the top early enough in life? I think the problem is attitude. And our attitude is set by whatever we have been doing mostly. As far as students, since you face examination as the only measure of success in your life, 
your attitude is set by exams. Do you agree? How much time do you spend preparing for exam, worrying for exam, looking at the results, gloating over good results, feeling bad about bad results? You take your entire life, a substantial portion of your thinking activity has been spent around examinations. Am I right? Examination is therefore a rat race. It's a competition. There are a few winner rats. The winner rats acquire overconfidence. And if you are not careful, that overconfidence converts into arrogance. I am great. Since I am great and I have proven myself to be great by scoring some marks in some stupid exam, I think I don't need to learn anything from anybody else. That is arrogance. On the other hand, there are some loser rats. What happens to the loser rats? The loser rats have gone below the screen. So you can see them. They develop diffidence. If I got only 40% marks and you got 90% marks, not only you think you are great, even I think you are great. That is okay. But I think I am bad. I think I am no good. That creates diffidence and it might lead to despondence. I might give up in life. Both are completely nonsensical. You must move with the right amount of confidence and you must understand that the marks alone do not define either your capability or your achievement. Don't forget that in any rat race, while there are a few winner rats and a large number of loser rats, but a rat race produces only rats, not human beings. And you are human beings. Each one of you is an individual human being. What should be the kind of attitude that you should have? The attitude should be full of curiosity, full of boldness to ask questions, and <clears throat> full of perseverance. I call it the attitude of the child. The child has many bad attitudes, but there are some good attitudes, and I believe these are attitudes. And these permit the child to acquire such fantastic knowledge, which is very difficult to achieve later. How many of you have tried to study a foreign language? German, Arabic, French, some of you. You would have seen many people who do a two-year, three-year course, preliminary course, intermediate course, advanced course, and after that, they are able to speak a little bit in that language and can read and understand, but cannot understand if somebody is speaking very rapidly. That's the level of achievement. After doing large number of courses, getting very good marks, studying books, giving exams, everything. And yet, as human child, each one of you has learned a foreign language between the age of three years and six years, which is later on called your mother tongue. No class, no exam, no marks. Nobody will tell you you are 40 percent or he is 90 percent. Every one of you has learned to articulate yourself into your mother tongue reasonably well by the time you are six years old. I am not suggesting that intellectually all human beings are equal. What I am suggesting is, why there would be delta or two delta or five delta difference, the basic intellectual capability to solve very difficult problem of learning a foreign language, God has endowed us all with that capability. And that's the reason why I say, if I have 40 marks or 90 marks, I don't care one who, because I also studied my mother tongue the same way as you did. If you are 40 marks and I am 90 marks, I don't feel elated and top of the world because I know humbly that you also learned your mother tongue when you were young. I would humbly suggest again, please try and imbibe this attitude of equanimously handling life. The course organization is described on the second page, the back of the page. There is more to follow on the websites. The websites will be up updated by Saturday midnight. What happened is I did not get my complement of TAs. As I told you, there will be two lectures. And in these lectures, the interaction will be very difficult. The interaction will happen through questions that you will have to ask. But asking questions cannot perhaps happen in the normal interactive way that will happen in a class of 40 or 50. So you will be required to write down questions. And you will be required to write down questions while you are attending the lecture. So you'll arrange a format, a slip with roll number, or whatever, whatever. You will have enough of them. You can keep them, and you'll have to submit them. And either in an extra lecture or in a regular lecture, I'll spend 15 minutes identifying the question and the questioner, which I believe could be of common interest. 
all questions would be answered invariably by your teaching assistants. It should be very obvious to you that 850 students in the true sense of Guru Shishya Parampara cannot be handled by one teacher. I should have 850 replicas of myself. But engineering has not yet perfected the art of replicating human beings. So you'll have to contend with only one teacher. So you will have to depend upon my teaching assistants. And the teaching assistants will be interacting with you during the lab sessions. You will have a two-hour lab every week. The lab groups have to be formed. I have indicated a complicated logic. I wanted to disperse all of you sort of randomly across. I didn't want metallurgical engineering students bunching together, physics students bunching together, and so on. So what I have done is, I have decided that there will be 10 batches since we have 10 slots, and the last digit of your roll number decides what batch you are in. Easy to remember? So you are either group 0, group 1, group 2, group 3, group 4. This unfortunately created a problem because group 1 and group 2 have larger number of students. Obviously, if you take a, a statistical spread, that will happen. So those roll numbers which start with 4-1 and 4-2 have been shifted to the corresponding group on the same day. That sort of equitably distributes everybody. Uh, you, will, you will figure that out uh, in the next lecture on Monday before the lab begins. I will elaborate it more. But we now go to quizzes. So while we discuss, a quiz paper will be distributed. Can you come and collect it, please? Uh, this has 10 questions. And this is an unmarked quiz. So don't worry about losing marks. I know that although I have told you it's a rat race, you all enjoy participating in rat race because that is how you have come here. The unfortunate part of any course is that associated with the course, there will be an evaluation. I am still deciding how the grading would be done, what percentage of weightage of marks to be associated with what activity. I'll explain that on Monday when I finalize it. But most probably my early thoughts will appear on the websites that I will indicate there. While the, these papers are being distributed, uh, you, you don't start writing these down now. I want you to take this as a take-home quiz. So just carry these quiz papers back. If we can finish in five minutes, this quiz will not take more than five minutes because basic background information. But I would like you to fill these up individually and submit these back on uh, preferably by tomorrow, so we'll keep a drop box there, mark CS101. You just drop one or more of your friends these things. What I require, however, that you, can, you may collectively drop all the papers, but every individual must write answers to these questions oneself and honestly. So let me also describe to you some characteristics of IIT Bombay in general and particularly of mine in the matters of evaluation. Since people will come with varied background, as I have already stated, you need not be worried. You do not require to do well in this course. You do not require anything other than your high school math background. So you cover everything. The pace in IIT is generally much faster than the school education. That is something you'll have to get accustomed to. However, those who already know programming, this, this, this is the first quiz. Let me go to the first quiz and then carry on. So what is the level of familiarity you have with computers? This question is asked in that paper, so I'll get formal feedback from each one of you. But just can you raise your hands? Those who have never seen a computer in your life. Absolutely nobody. I thought there'll be at least 10 people. Everybody has seen a computer in life. OK, good. Now let's go to the next step, because seeing is not sufficient. Seen and used, let's say, for surfing the web. Anybody who has not done that, Anybody who has not surfed the web on a computer? Oh, one, two. OK. Those people who belong to either category A or category B, OK, let, let's just look at category C. Emails, anybody who has not used computers for sending and receiving emails, can you raise your hand? They're not used. There are quite a few. 
who have learned some computer programming. This time you have learned some computer programming, raise your hands. Ah, a large number of people. So there are some questions for your category. Those who claim to have learned programming, how many programs have you written, what is the longest program, etc. Et now, this is important. The others might feel that these people already know computer programming, so they have a great advantage over us. I would be worried about such a thing. They certainly will have an advantage. Anybody who comes with a better background in any particular field of knowledge, which is the path of studies, will always have an advantage over others. But it will not be a disadvantage to others. That is what I wanted to tell you. It is just that they are starting at certain level. You can catch up with them and you can surpass them. However, those who know programming must also understand that they cannot keep sitting tight in the class, do nothing, learn nothing new, and still claim to have acquired greater knowledge. The challenges in programming are infinite. I have been programming for 40 years of my life and I still have a lot to learn. So there is always more to learn. Please remember that. In general, the evaluation methodology followed in this course will be that if you do your normal lab instructions, assignments and exams well, you will have no problem in clearing this course. If you do it to the best of your ability, you should get a good grade. But to get an A grade is going to be damn tough. It doesn't matter whether you know programming already or you don't. So there is a non-linear scale of the level of difficulty that you will find in the exam papers. There will be a large number of assignments and exam questions which will be relatively simple if you understood basic concepts and worked hard, you will be able to crack them. There will be a few questions of medial level of complexity where you have to struggle really. And there will always be a couple of questions which will be very, very difficult. And I particularly enjoy putting at least one question which nobody can solve. Because if somebody can solve, it will solve a very great problem. And that's a matter of pride for the entire class. Have you failed in any subject in your education so far? Once, can you raise your hands? Okay. A few times? Okay, a few hands. Never? Raise your hands. And D, I do not see why this is important. Very few. But I like these hands. How does it matter whether I have never failed or I have failed 15 times? I am coming here as a human being aspiring to learn something new. Why are you judging me by my past? I am preparing for the future. So judge me on what I do in the present. I think all of you should opt for D, no matter what is ABC. Do you agree? For those who have done programming, here is a program. Count substring dollar one comma length dollar one comma one plus plus and for I in count, print I count I. This program is written in C. C++, Java, or none of these. A, sorry, it, it got G. That G is not the option, A is the option. So who says A? One, two, three. C++, who says B? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. C, Java, who says Java? More number of people. I can see that people are confused because this does not sound familiar to any one of them who have probably studied some of these languages. None of these. How many say none of these? That is very funny. There are only four choices. So people opting for at least one of them, if you sigma them together, they should amount to 850. The sum total I calculated mentally was about 50 or so. So I must add one more thing. I have no opinion. That's not good. Ah, you are saying some other language. Okay, which one? Ah, that's the problem. The reason you did not raise your hand is, I will ask you which one then and you won't know. The language is called AWK. A -W -K. So what does this program do if it produces this output? Zero seven five one nine four two nine one three eight five four eight three etc etc. Any guesses? 
Sabi? Okay, can I go back to the program? A very strong analytical mind. Here. You see, I am not showing you a vital evidence. What is the input data on which this program is operating to produce that output? This program actually takes all the roll numbers of students of this class, looks at the last digit, and increments an element in an array to add the count. So what you see here are count of people with roll number ending in 0, 75, people with roll number ending in 194, ending in 291, ending in 385. You will now understand why I had to shift some people from group 1 and group 2, where I simply don't have those many computers in my lab. So group 1, some people will be shifted to group 0, and group 2, some people will be shifted to group 9. The rest of them will keep them as it is. Okay, thank you very much.